our community is filled with beauty. When we open the door to greet one another, that's where the beauty begins. When we share what's important with each other, beauty is there as we listen. When we join hands to practice compassion, beauty's heart blooms like the flowers. When we teach or learn or work for justice and for peace, beauty abounding sparks joy in all. Come, let us share that beauty and worship together. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Berkeley. I'm Deborah Schmidt, and I will be your worship associate today. This is a welcoming congregation, and we are always working on how to better welcome and care for one another. If this is your first time here, we're so glad you've come, and whoever you are, we welcome you in the fullness of who you are. As we begin, we want to acknowledge that this church occupies land in Huchin, the unceded territory of the chochenyo speaking Ohlone people. We understand that we continue to benefit from the seizure and occupation of this land. We acknowledge and embrace our responsibility to take restorative action. We affirm that this is deeply felt and commit our congregation to be in right relationship with indigenous communities, aligning in solidarity, supporting indigenous projects, and caring properly for the land. Now, as Reverend Michelle lights the callous flame, let's kindle our own flames along with her to these words by Suzelle Lynch. Let's light the chalice for beauty now. The beauty we seek, the beauty we share. 
the beauty we nurture together. We also pause to remind ourselves of some of the foundations of resilience. With Reverend Michelle, we light a candle of courage, a candle of acts of service, a candle of fellowship, and a candle of hope. May we find and cultivate these foundations of resilience in ourselves and in one another. Now please join us in singing our opening song for the beauty of the earth. The words will be on the screen. join with me in saying our covenant. You can remain risen if you wish. Love guides this church. The quest for truth and justice is its common purpose. To give thanks, listen deeply, speak with care, honor our differences, and seek and grant forgiveness. These things we covenant with one another. You may be seated. When the little blue bird who has hardly said a word starts to sing spring i 
As Unitarian Universalists, our values urge us to support and celebrate life's many stages. One of the ways we do this is through our Our Whole Lives program. OWL, we call it, is a comprehensive sexuality program. It is a rigorous but gradual rite of passage. Beginning in kindergarten, we offer classes through adolescence, and some churches also have adult programs. It is a comprehensive sexual, uh, sorry, it is a comprehensive lifespan sexual development curriculum that is designed to guide participants through issues of sexuality in developmentally appropriate ways with integrity, honesty, and empowerment. Topics across the age span range from knowing your own body to relationship and communication skills, sexual health and decision making, consent, gender identity, and thinking critically about media and societal messages. The purpose is to help people gain knowledge and skills needed to express sexuality in holistic and life enhancing ways. Beginning in January, we have been facilitating an OWL program for seventh through ninth graders that include not only youth from our congregation, but youth from Epworth Methodist Church as well. Can the OWL participants and facilitators please come forward, ma'am? I'd like to ask that the L facilitators and the congregation join me in saying the words of the following body blessing adapted but from words by Lisa Bovey Kemper. The words should be on the screen as we get to each stage. <laughs> so maybe the facilitators might need to. <laughs> um, all right. Owl participants, if you would please humor us by placing your hands on each part of your body as we bless it. So this first one is your forehead. May you be blessed, so this is congregation too. <laughs> May you be blessed with knowledge and wisdom. Your mind can reason and you have free will. Be thoughtful in the choices you make. The next one is your throat. May you be blessed with voice. Express yourself. Speak up for the worth of others when it is questioned. Ask for consent. Tell those you love that you love them. The next one is heart. May your heart be filled with love. When you know heartache, remember to be kind. Listen hard for the wisdom in your heart and always trust the truth it tells. The next is your abdomen. You are blessed with an amazing body. Remember it is sacred and belongs to you alone. Enjoy it and never forget to take care of yourself. Put your hands on your hands. <laughs> when we fall, we catch ourselves with our hands. We reach out, we hug each other. With them, we express love and comfort. May your hands be gentle and strong. May your life always be blessed with caring and compassion. Now you can wrap your arms around your whole body. Remember you are loved. You are never alone. Your heart, your mind, your body, maybe even your identity will change. No matter what, we love you. All of us bless you. Each step of the way, 
on this wild journey as you learn to love and to live into your body. Thank you. And thank you. Carry our blessings with you wherever you go. I just wanted to keep saying that we have so enjoyed taking this part of, the, of your journey with you. And uh, we look forward to seeing where the rest of it may go. Um, I was told that I was going to get a text that apparently the, uh, the kids took a donation for OWL and that there was, oh, I got a text. And that the, the kids of OWL class raised $600 for the OWL program. Thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you. And thank you all for blessing our lovely OWL participants. It is uh, now time for the youth and the children to go out. Oh, there's more. It just keeps coming. Apparently, it just keeps coming. There's more and more. Oh, thank you. Hi, as the parents, we just wanted to thank the OWL, facil Owl facilitators for generously donating their time and their love for our youth. We're just so grateful for this program. Um, wanted to especially thank Alice, who's been just a great leader of OWL and I think the kids wanted to maybe just say one quick thing. Yeah. Rory, <laughs> we're just looking at each other. <laughs> uh, thank you guys. It's been actually really fun, and like Owl was always the highlight of my week, and it was really. Oh wait. Oh. It's been really fun, and Owl was always the highlight of my week, and it was great to get to know everyone, like here and the kids, and. It was awesome, so thank you. I found a partner at OWL. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. I walked in the first day, and I was like, that's the one. That's the one right there. It was great, thank you. All right, so let's sing our children and youth to their classes now. And thank you so much, Alice, for your leadership too.
Please join now in the spirit of meditation with these words by Rebecca Savage. Sometimes we awake in the morning with a heaviness in our chest. Sometimes we awake in the morning or the middle of the night with the endless to-do list rattling through our thoughts, the nagging reminders of what might have been left undone yesterday. And the pangs of, I have to do it all again today, pinching us, pinching us at our insides. Sometimes we awake and we'd rather just go back to sleep. We'd rather escape under the covers, under a rock, the bottom of the closet. But then, then, the first sliver of sunshine may dance across the wall may dance across our face and kiss our eyes. Beautiful. And then the waiting, wafting scent of a new day may glide over us and remind us. Beautiful. And then signs of life blossom around us and include the inside of us. Beautiful, every day, beautiful. Amen. a reflection on the power of beauty to awaken. How is it that art and beauty have such power to change us from the inside out and thus even to change the world? Because art arises from the open heart, it opens hearts. Because it emerges from awakened compassion, it awakens compassion. And in this state of awakened compassion, we are empowered to move toward awareness and action to become the best humans we can possibly be. According to Hindu aesthetic theory, the power to experience aesthetic flavor is a reward for merit in some previous existence. Isn't that a lovely thought? When I learned that, it brought tears to my eyes. What did I do? What did we all do in some previous life to become worthy of such bliss? The aesthetic appreciator, the person experiencing a work of art, and I think we can extend this to beauty, is called the sardaya, a Sanskrit term meaning with the heart or of equal heart. 
I found a wonderful paper by Sundara Rajan and Raina called Mind and Creativity, and this is a quote from them defining the Sardaya. To be a Sardaya is to become surcharged with an overpowering longing for ideal beauty, suggesting a total displacement of the person in time and space. It is a pressing call from afar, and one is carried away to a distant and yet so close shore of unfathomable ocean, of infinite existence. It is virtually nothing else than a rebirth or a passage through the gate of death, as it automatically brings annihilation of the limited self. And that's the end of the quote. It seems to me that this wonder, the transport, the loss of sense of time, the loss of sense of self experienced by the sardaya in the contemplation of an artistic creation are also experienced in contemplation of the natural world, the beauty of creation that much of human art emulates. When we lose ourselves, in contemplation of beauty, we enter the place where compassion awakes. The Latin roots of compassion are com, with, plus passio, suffering. But I think the meaning can be extended from suffering to any sort of empathic feeling. When we lose ourselves in deep regard for something beautiful, we become one with the creator, the divine, the spirit of life. It is a return to the spiritual oneness of infants, of the soul before birth, or of Adam and Eve in the garden before eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge struck them with self-consciousness, consciousness of self. The Eden story can be read as an allegory for the journey of the soul, for we begin in oneness and then of necessity must differentiate in order to function in the world, especially in our Western culture with this emphasis on individuality. The necessary habits of perception that get us through our days also stand in the way of the kind of deep perception that exists at the core of creativity and the aesthetic experience. But we journey back toward that oneness we have lost and for which we never cease yearning and beauty and is essential part of that journey. Thank you. So there's an Arthuri Arthurian tale that's similar to the story of the frog prince with a few extra twists, of course. Let's keep it interesting. It is the tale of Sir Gawain and the Dame Ragnell, which is also the story of King Arthur and the Ferocious Green Knight. Y'all heard this one? Oh wait, there's nods here. Okay. Well, King Arthur had been threatened with decapitation by the Green Knight if he could not come up with an answer to the question that the Green Knight posed to him. The question, what do women really want. Now, King Arthur took this seriously. He traveled the entire kingdom in search of the answer, and by and by, he met the Dame Ragnell. Now, like the frog in the Frog Prince, she was rather hideous to look at, frankly, the ugliest hag that he had ever seen. Face red, nose besnotted. Isn't Arthurian language great? Nose besnotted, mouth wide, teeth yellow and hanging down over her lips, and the rest of her pretty much followed suit. She made a deal with King Arthur that if Sir Gawain would agree to marry her, she would tell them the answer. Well, Sir Gawain, being gallant and all, agreed. So King, answer got, King, answer, King Arthur got his answer. What women want most is sovereignty to be in charge of their own decisions and their own life. Thus, Sir Gawain and the Dame Ragnell were married. On their wedding night, Sir Gawain laid down beside her and she asked him teasingly for a kiss. 
Being gallant and all, he assured her he would do more than just kiss her. At this point, like the frog prince, or like Princess Fiona in Shrek, if you will, she turned into a beautiful woman. She then presented Sir Gawain with a choice. She could be beautiful at day when others saw her, or she could be beautiful at night just for him. The choice was his. Now, Sir Gawain had been paying attention. Have you been paying attention? So he wisely answered, my lady, the choice is yours. With her autonomy acknowledged, she declared that henceforth she would be beautiful all the time. Isn't that a fabulous story? Yes. The holy grail of beauty has been sought after for ages. People have sought after creating beauty, acquiring beautiful things, finding beautiful things, becoming beautiful themselves. So first, what is beauty, and what does beautiful even mean? Because the fact is that it is so much more than just the physical attractiveness and loveliness that we heard in Sir Gawain's story, although that is a good place to start. It is often the first thing that folks think of when they try to define beauty. And there is certainly a long, long human history shaping perceptions of what makes someone beautiful, which is only recently turning towards opening up to what beautiful means and finding the beauty in each and every person. Because instead, throughout history, beautiful bodies have been much more narrowly defined. And people have gone to great lengths to try to achieve that narrow definition of beauty. From the foot binding that Chinese women underwent, to the corsets that European and American women, and even men, by the way, the corsets they squeezed into in order to have thinner and thus more beautiful waists. Many other aspects have dominated many cultural perceptions and norms of beauty, including the perception of beauty being lighter skin, straighter hair, and narrower features, which historically connect back to overt racial superiority tactics. Now today, there are many individual voices trying to counterbalance this history, like the well-known project by Dove Soap. And if you haven't seen this one, I totally recommend looking it up on YouTube. What they did is recorded videos of how women reacted to being told they were beautiful. And they did another one where sketches were done of how women described themselves and then sketches were done of someone else describing the same women. And then the sketches were put side by side. But I worry that these historical cultural norms about beauty are still widespread and maybe too entrenched to be able to change, at least to make major shifts. At least not like that. Now recently, Mattel came out with a new line of Barbies. See, you might have guessed we get to Barbie on a sermon about beauty, right? But they came out with a new line of Barbies sporting more variety in body shapes. But you know, even the plus size Barbie still looks fairly lean. And if you look down the aisle of Barbies at the store, you've got the little section that's the body variety, and then the rest of them that are that thin, impossible hourglass look. And then eating disorders continue to be widespread amongst our teenage girls and teenage boys and adults too, going down to even age eight. Clearly, many of our cultural manifestations about beauty are problematic in many ways. But thank goodness, beauty isn't confined to narrow definitions of physical bodily attractiveness. This also brings us to wonder whether beauty is subjective or objective, or maybe a combination of both. Is beauty in the eye of the beholder, so to speak, or is there some universal ideal of beauty? Now, I certainly think that my cats are absolutely beautiful, as is the exact shade of blue that my house is painted. But I might not find others who precisely agree with me on that. On the other hand, I find Vincent van Gogh's Starry Starry Night absolutely beautiful, and there are many others who 
who would agree with me on that? How many in this room? Yeah. Are there things that are universally beautiful? Is universally beautiful? Is beauty universal? Now, there have been some studies done on infants trying to get before, you know, too many cultural perceptions shape them. There have been studies done on infants, including those only a few hours old, of how they react to different things. When shown photographs of two different faces, infants will spend more time looking at one that is closer to the average combination of human features. Does that mean that that one is more beautiful and that's why they're attracted to it? Another thing that's been tested, get this, they like the music of Vivaldi played better forwards than they like it played backwards. <laughs> well, it is, okay, goofy to do studies of how infants react to music played backwards as well as forwards, and who on earth came up with that anyway? It still presents some interesting questions. Are we born with automatic perceptions that some things are more pleasant than others? Is there a reason so many children name blue as their favorite color, other than the fact it's awesome? And then the rest of them, okay, adults, how many of us think purple is an awesome color? Yes. That beauty is even wider than this. It is also something more than just the sum of its parts. Celtic poet John O'Donohue says this, beauty isn't all about just nice loveliness. Beauty is about more rounded, substantial becoming. So I think beauty, he says, in that sense, is about an emerging fullness. So I remember seeing folks practicing a particular Japanese flower arranging style, ikebana was what it was called. They would show up with a pile of various flowers, all pretty, but you know, flowers. Maybe some greens, some bamboo, and this weird pokey thing. It was a dish that had a spiky pokey thing in it that they would stick everything into. They would take these pieces, pretty pieces by themselves, but they would turn them into asymmetrical works of art. It wasn't just the pieces, it was how they came together that made them what they became. So one Sunday morning, an Ikebana arrangement had been put together for the front of the church where I was serving. And somehow, between when it was put together and Sunday morning, about a third of the flowers had died. So they weren't intended to. It changed the look. I said, okay, this is no longer beautiful. So I went up and pulled out all the dead, the dead flowers and tried to push the remaining ones around into something aesthetically pleasing without success. In the minutes before the service started, we had these, these pieces and these, okay, okay, it looks simple, but I can't do it. So I started frantically looking around for any of the flower arrangers, hoping they could do something with it. I found one a few minutes before the service started. She went up and somehow, with like a minute or two, she took these pieces and turned them back into beautiful art. I have no idea how she did it, but she took what was there and transformed it into something more. What do you feel when you encounter something beautiful, something truly beautiful? Do you feel it in your heart? Does your breath catch? Do you gasp, wow, that's beautiful? Beauty and religion are fundamentally connected. In fact, there isn't a single great religious or spiritual tradition that has not created or promoted beauty in its realizations and artistic productions, not one. Islam states that God is beautiful and loves beauty. It is central to the manifestation of that faith. Think of the many religious structures of beauty that have been created over time, from the great cathedrals and art on their walls to stained glass creations, to the beauty of Tibetan chanting. When beauty is found, there is something else of a transcendent order that flows through the beauty in a way that makes it a means to a higher end. Some say that the Buddhas save not only through their doctrine and teaching, but also 
the Buddhas save through their beauty. Speaking of paradise, the Quran teaches, is the reward of beauty other than beauty itself? The Arabic word here for beauty can be translated as goodness and is a quasi-indefinable term that Sufis had te have tended to understand as inner beauty or beauty of character or else the perfection of adoration. Beauty itself is a divine language. And Unitarian Ralph Waldo Emerson went so far as to say that beauty is the creator of the universe. One hopes through that beauty does not exist just for its sake, a reward in and of itself. It is more and we need it. We need it for itself, for itself to be, and we need it to be more. So here's another wonderful quote, slightly longer one again, from the Celtic poet John O'Donohue, who I could frankly just read all day. Here's what he says. The human soul is hungry for beauty. When we experience the beautiful, there is a sense of homecoming. Some of our most wonderful memories are beautiful places where we felt immediately at home. We feel most alive in the presence of the, beauty, of the beautiful, for it meets the needs of our souls. For a while, the strains of struggle and endurance are relieved, and our frailty is illuminated by a different light, in which we come to, gl to glimpse behind the shutter of appearances and sure form of things. In the experience of beauty, we awaken and surrender all in the same act. Beauty brings a sense of completion and sureness. Without any of the usual calculation, we can slip into the beautiful with the same ease that we slip into the seamless embrace of water. Something ancient within us already trusts that this embrace will hold us. Being held by the ancient embrace of beauty, doesn't that sound absolutely marvelous? I think of how I feel after experiencing something beautiful, whether it is a beautiful animal I see, a beautiful landscape picture, a beautiful song, even a beautiful chord that is struck, maybe a beautiful idea. It does something to us. It calms us and grounds us and connects us to something larger. It connects us to the best of all creation. As Donahue, O'Donohue says, beauty meets the needs of our soul, and for a while, the strains of struggle and endurance are relieved. There is a lot of struggle and a lot of endurance that we need, do we not? One of the things that I talk about on a regular basis is resilience, both our personal resilience as well as that of our communities and our relationships. Resilience is critical for the ongoing and escalating challenges that we face. We have to be able to stay on our feet, or at least stay moving, however that might look for each of us in our bodies. We have to be able to stay. We have to be able to go. Whatever feelings we have, dismay, anger, disgust, overwhelm, and all the rest. We need things to help us be resilient so we can keep going and act on our feelings in ways that are appropriate and helpful. We need things to keep us going and to spur us on. So why not beauty? UU Minister Mary Catherine Morn writes, beauty does more than awaken us. It also admonishes us. It demands something. We are here so that beauty might heed the admonitions, so that we are here so that together we might heed the admonitions of beauty, answer its call to create, protect, and preserve. And philosopher and mathematician Blaise Pascal wrote, in difficult times, carry something beautiful in your heart. In difficult times, carry something beautiful in your heart. Can beauty save the world, as Dostoevsky once asked? 
can be re-saved the world. You know, I'm not sure about that. But I know beauty can save us. And not only can it save us, beauty can remind us of the world, the divine around us, the world and the divine within us. Beauty is the creator of the universe. Let's not lose sight of it. Let's carry it in our hearts, no matter what. May it be so. We have come to the point in the service when we invite you to make an offering. For now, we're conducting the offering in the sanctuary without passing the plate. Instead, you can either give electronically or you can take a donation envelope from the back of the pew in front of you and place it with your donation into the donation box beside the fountain in the atrium. Each week, Half of our plate offering is shared with a good neighbor organization recommended by our Social Justice Council. This month, our good neighbor is the Berkeley Food and Housing Project, whose mission is to ease and end the crisis of homelessness in our communities. Berkeley Food and Housing Project lives its mission by providing emergency food and shelter, transitional housing, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing and support services to individuals and families experiencing homelessness. Offerings of any value are always received with gratitude. Thank you.
Paul and Rod and Brian, that was absolutely beautiful. And thank you to our choir, Luminescence, for all of your beautiful music, too. All right, it has been great being together today. But before we shift to stuff after church, I have announcements. Ready? Ready? First one after the service is a congregational meeting. We get to act out our polity and democracy and vote and do stuff together as a congregation. Oh, goody, someone said, yay. So please do, there's some snacks that you can grab and then come on back in for the congregational meeting. It'll also be on Zoom. So if you're watching us online right now, pop over to the website, find the Zoom link, and you'll be able to Zoom in to participate in the congregational meeting. Now, two weeks from today, on June 5th, 5th, I think so, did you know it's Halloween? Yeah, of course you've heard that. Since we didn't get to do Halloween, since we are virtual in the fall, we are having Halloween. So that Sunday, you are encouraged to wear a costume. It's going to be a super fun day as we celebrate Halloween together. Thank you for laughing, it's fabulous. So for the next few weeks, so a group met yesterday to delve into as part of our overall conversation on the past, present, and future of the church's Freestone Retreat property in Sonoma County. A group met yesterday to begin to delve into some of the parts of that past. And I encourage you to take part in that also. Over in the social hall on one of the walls is a great big timeline. Take a look at what's there. There are events there, there are people's experiences there. Take a look at what's there, add some of your own. There's instructions and index cards there, and it's gonna be up for a few weeks, so come back and take a look and see what other people have put up as time goes on also, as we work to embrace and acknowledge the past of that property and where we have come from as a church. And last, I have a super exciting announcement. I would like to introduce to you this is Heaven Walker, who is, as of today, joining our community and staff as our brand new Director of Family Ministry. I could say many, many things about why we were, I'm so excited that Heaven is joining us, this uh, DFM Selection Committee had hard choices and we were so excited, we feel like we lucked out. And Heaven comes to us from our local area, has lots of really cool connections, lo knows lots of folks around here, and has taught world religions in different community colleges, and is gonna be working with our children and youth and with religious exploration education for adults also. So we are all gonna get to benefit from Heaven's fabulous work and ministry here. So thank you and welcome Heaven. I just wanted to say how delighted I am to meet all of you and what a blessing that we actually get to meet in person finally and I can see many of you smiling with your eyes as we do with our mask with COVID so thank you for that <laughs> um, and I have many hats that I have worn many things to offer you so I want to say that the former professor in me is so excited about religious education I want to say that the former preschool teacher and elementary educator is so excited to teach and nurture your children, and the mother in me will treat them as if they are my own. And um, the director in me wants to tell you that I um, am always available in here for you. So uh, I'm always available for a word. I, my phone line is open, and as we do with COVID, my Zoom line will be open for your suggestions and conversations, and I'm so blessed to be here with you. So thank you so much, and I look forward to getting to know you better. And our members of the selection team here, any of y'all here? Yes, thank you. At least there was one, one hand back there. Thank you to the members of the selection team and to many folks who contributed to our thinking about what we were looking for that brought us to Finding Heaven. All right, now let's sing to close out our time, although it's not closing out our time because you're coming back for the congregational meeting, right? Yes? 
Rising green, please rise in body or in spirit. The words will be up on screen. spirit of life. What to do with beauty, or joy for that matter, in the midst of tragedy, of violence, of cruelty? What do we do with the living? We give each their due. Do not lose ourselves in any of it, but find ourselves anew. Where there is beauty, amplify it. Where beauty is hidden, reveal it. Where beauty is ruined, restore it. Where beauty is absent, create it. This is our gift to our aching world. And now from this time of worship, may you go with hope, with connection, and with beauty. And remember, you're never all alone. Blessed be. Mm -hmm. 